of our single family neighborhoods? Well, anyone been following the news and legislation recently know we now have new state legislation that basically is going to make it easier to build that second unit on a residential, single family residential property, the ADUs, uh, et cetera. This is in Seattle uh, and there's some great places on a single family lot about how you can create that additional space because we talk about a housing shortage and we talk about millennials in some cases only looking for 600 square feet or even less in terms of a living environment, et cetera, and housing being important. This is in Davis, uh, et cetera. So there are plenty of examples of how they can be fit and designed. We can also do things like this, if you're familiar with the uh, Blackbirds in, in I believe it's Echo Park or somewhere around there, Island Park area, et cetera. This is a remnant parcel where you see the product that has been inserted in a single family neighborhood. It's a project that has greater density than your typical six units per acre or seven units per acre surrounding area and fits very effectively. And this is an infill project that actually the neighborhood kind of likes. You know, I, I think whenever we talk about adding density in single family neighborhoods, the thought is you're talking about a 20 story building. You completely change the character of our area. But if it's done right, designed right, fit right within the area, I think we would find some increasing acceptance uh, for uh, some additional housing product within our neighborhoods themselves. I've talked before about adaptive reuse of existing buildings. We can see plenty of that going on. So here's some sort of examples, also schematically. So this again is sort of a typical corridor we have today, automobile oriented. And this is a demonstration how you can take the same corridor, not add 20 or 30 story buildings, but how you can use the surface parking lots and infill buildings at a comparable height and density. This becomes less frightening when you add that density than uh, when you are uh, as in opposition to higher density development. So this shows how you can begin to infill. Of course, this solution would require parking uh, structures of some kind as well. This is part of the work that was done for the Sacramento plans, taking an existing corridor on Stockton Avenue and basically demonstrating how that could be an infill change in a way that it makes a rather substantial improvement to that neighborhood by adding housing, by adding mixed use uh, development, uh, et cetera, with, within the neighborhood as well. Uh, this is, <laughs> probably don't want to go for this one too long, another issue project, Bergamot. Uh, this is a section for Bergamot. This is uh, on Nebraska before and where it could be afterwards. We'll have a whole another kind of conversation about Santa Monica and Bergamot someday <laughs> as well. This is, again, we said before, every community has numerous of these kind of sites. Grocery store anchor center, you know, drugstore, you know, whatever, donut shop, whatever, uh, beauty shop. This is San Diego. They had a site uh, in the Hillcrest area that was that before. <clears throat> the developer wanted to develop a new uh, grocery store, you know, typical grocery store center, the community said, we've got enough of those. We want you to do something else. And this is what they did. This now is about, my gosh, it's on the cover of Progressive Architecture when Progressive Architecture was still being published. How many years ago? Can you remember when Progressive Architecture was one of the key architectural magazines? <clears throat> this was around about 30 years ago. So what they did, as you will see here, this is the grocery store that was built but they created a village. It's truly mixed use. And from the ground level, this is they created a village. And again, uh, infill on that site, reuse instead of that grocery store. The grocery store is there, but now you have it down, not with a lot of asphalt parking lot. You have housing on top of the use that every community I work in says is our number one priority, Trader Joe's. We want a Trader Joe's. And you have housing on top of it. You have integrated community facilities, community services room for the seniors and groups, and you vary density to step down to the adjoining single family neighborhood. It's created a place, <clears throat> because if you go back to the aerial, or back to this slide, and it's this slide, you'll see this network of rain spaces around which provides the common area and provides the framework, the infrastructure, not the roadway infrastructure, but the infrastructure green, that everything hangs on together, that basically the buildings have been sited around and the public places. Uh, this has been an icon 
for a lots of people. So this is an example of a reuse of a mall. This is a Mountain View, California. Lots of money up there. Called Tech. Because this is Apple and Google. We went through Google and Tech. This site right here, the traditional mall, the in indoor mall with a couple pads outside with the surrounding asphalt. This is what it is like now, that grid that you see up there. You'll see some photographs of it. So this is what it became. You see a rather different configuration of buildings. It's mixed use. It's around a transit station, uh, housing, retail, commercial, grocery stores, etc. So what you begin to see is first the transit station where Caltrain is. And then you will also see a variety of housing products, townhomes, etc. And then you will see in this area is still a work in progress, but they're creating, instead of that kind of density, they're creating a higher density kind of environment, even though this is a grocery store right there. But they're creating, indeed, a more walkable, instead of this automobile-oriented kind of center. And again, they're focusing upon a network. You can see barely here in the, in the area, you'll see this sort of infrastructure of green spaces that, again, tie buildings together, etc. And there is a direct connection right through, now through here, all the way to the transit line. So you have this direct relationship to transit, walkable to transit, et cetera, in a very walkable uh, environment. This is Mission Meridian in South Pasadena. When we talk about transit-oriented <coughs> development, we hear again from the public, it's going to be big, it's going to be density, it's going to be pretty awful. Well, the top is Mission Meridian which is a relatively low density, houses that are evocative of craftsmen, well they are craftsmen design, uh, Stephanos Pezzoni's project, and you see in the massive model to the right, there was a very key sensitivity. That project's 40 units per acre, which you, you, know, you create fear when you talk about 40 units per acre in many communities. The community loves this because it's of a scale that indeed complements the rest of South Pasadena around the Mission Meridians <coughs> Stadium, et cetera. And again, the multifamily units, as you will see there, open up to the street. They're oriented towards the street, so they aren't hidden behind a wall. They're not separated to become part of the community. This is Pasadena, the Del Mar Station, same architect, interestingly enough, <laughs> within the area. And then you have newer projects at higher density. This is Culver City. Uh, this is the rendering for the project that's under construction right now, over there. And then, of course, varying density. But again, it's back to that first cautionary slide. There are places where this kind of density makes sense. Wilshire uh, and, West, and Western, etc. That makes sense. That's a scale that is complementary to that particular area. There are other areas where it doesn't make sense. So we need to be very thoughtful when we make decisions about where and how dense it's going to be that are sympathetic to the scale of character. So a couple of slides on reusing brownfield. This is the old, Met, this is downtown Manhattan Beach. These are again an area that we can begin because there are plenty of these kind of underutilized or properties that are <coughs> no longer in use. This was the old Metbox pottery uh, factory. City Hall's right over here, piers right down there. And this was what it was like. Heavily polluted site, because if you're making pottery, you have lots of acids and other kinds of goodies that you don't necessarily want in, in your neighborhood, etc. And this is what it is now, totally redeveloped in a hotel, mixed use, uh, commercial, some actually great bar, by the way. Uh, and, uh, and But again, what they did is they designed it so it has this rhythm, even though it's a single project, You'll see there's a rhythm, architectural rhythm of those buildings <coughs> along the street. It doesn't appear, again, like the grove as a big singular wall. They created, indeed, a rhythm of facades, not deeply you know, offset and recessed, but enough visually that it creates a sense of individual buildings rather than overskill and scale. And they designed it all around a great public space uh, on the interior of, of the building themselves. At a different scale, this is Portland, I mentioned before, <clears throat> the north end of Portland, downtown Portland, in the district. This is, how many of you have been to the Pearl? How uh, many of you have seen this? Really, only two? <laughs> what I tell my students at USC every semester is I say, before the semester is over, 
I require you, we're not going to graduate from this or get through this class, to get a ticket on an airplane, fly to Portland, you don't need a car, take transit from the airport downtown, take the streetcar up to here. This is a model of what we should be doing in Greenfield's development. It's an icon. Uh, retention of uh, some existence, the old Henry Weinhardt Brewery. Uh, the whole area has been incredibly redeveloped. It has a streetcar that you can ride free, connects downtown, and not only downtown, it goes all the way now down south to the area, of what's called Portland. South Portland area, which is, has a similar kind of development. It's a mix of adaptive reuse, older, funky industrial, with a lot of mixed use buildings within the area. All, all of them are LEED certified. There's not a single project here that's not an adaptive reuse. It's not LEED certified, and most of them are platinum level as well. This is part, a section of the plan, uh, from looking at, at the pearl from the air. Um, what is really interesting about this is this and this. They were very conscious that if we're building bricks and mortar, and we're building structure for people to live in, and businesses within the area, we can't forget the public realm. We need to integrate our plan. Each of the, those blocks replicates and is of the same size mm -hmm. block of downtown Portland, 200 feet by 200 feet. So 20,000 square feet. Most of our communities have standards that our parks can be no smaller than 10 acres. Park departments hate it if you don't have a 10 acre park. Well here, it's not even an acre. And there are, what they have done here is interspersed these throughout the grid pattern being replicated in the new development. What actually happened is the developer was given a bonus. These were not parks created by the city. These were parks where an additional FAR, for area ratio or density, was given to a developer in entitlement for the actual construction of these uh, parks and these amenities <laughs> within the area, working with the uh, then Portland Redevelopment Agency as well. These parks are also different in character. The one on top is called Tanner Springs Park. Tanner Springs Park is a replication and a reflection of the ecology of the area. The grasslands, the water, the wetlands, etc. It's a place you go sit, read, have a picnic, very quiet, etc. Two blocks south, you have Jameson Park, an incredibly active place. It's got a water feature, water rolling out, kids uh, there all the time, bocce ball, it is an amazing place, very active. So completely different experience just two blocks away from a very passive kind of environment to a very active kind of environment. Um, you would think Portland, where it rains a lot, places like this would not be successful. They're amazingly used to, uh, all year, most of you. Probably had snow up there recently, probably not recently. Uh, but anyway, the notion was as this area was being planned, again, it wasn't planning for an individual building on one of the sites. When they were planning, they thought about how do these buildings fit together to create a place? And how do we integrate with the green space within there? And then you go back for the slides in a moment here, you'll again notice that all of the new construction and incredible attention to streetscape and the detail of how the buildings relate to the street and the amenity that is in the public realm. And but finally, I don't want us to be all rosy because we are also reality, as I said before, this. Uh, big concern. Uh, we as planners and architects, um, I won't speak for you, but we generally in our professions have not done very well of communicating to the public, like that young gentleman that I mentioned in Pasadena. But basically he's told the story about how a wonderful environment could be created. We tend to be project oriented, and we tend not to be telling and creating communication materials and creating information that is understandable to the public. And hence, and we also then have political structure that's violated, like we showed you in Jefferson, La Cienega. So we have people who are basically going to shut down development in LA if they get their way, which this could happen. Uh, depending on what happens in March, uh, Measure Ish will shut down development in LA. Uh, Big concern. I have issues with the city of LA and how they've been practicing. I just hope it strikes the fear of somebody in them to get serious about their plans and how they do planning in the city and how they need to be planning. Other cities are much better than this, Pasadena, etc. Uh, I mentioned the Pasadena bought into the use of the density after that experience of the storytelling. 
So I think we as planners and architects have to know how to visualize in ways that are going to be indeed something <clears throat> that is what I call give a sense of quality of life and a sense of place for our community. And I don't think we are universally, I think there are exceptions, I think universally we're not doing a great job of it. It's usually the individual project or the individual group. So I challenge you as you go out there to be thinking about that as you move forward because I think there are some wonderful solutions here. We have a, as I said, a rapidly escalating market to accept these kinds of uses and this kind of living environments out there today. Um, so I think that's sort of our mission. So that. Well, let me mention, the, car, the cars are all in structures. You know, generally, what, in, like, for example, in the Portland project, we have a streetcar. But your cars, you have less parking spaces per residential unit. I mean, one of the objectives is to create and have a demand for less parking for the site if you have alternative modes of transportation moving around. I mentioned that gentleman in Pasadena said he didn't need his car because he was able to get around because of the mix of uses and the density of uses and the adjacency of traffic. If we create patterns of use that separate things that make you, force you to get in your car to go from point A to point B, home to work or other places, then that's going to, you're going to have higher demand for, for cars. I think what, what's also interesting about this whole housing affordability issue is a parking space today in a structure is probably $50,000 plus or minus as well. If we, in our codes, require two parking spaces per, let's say, residential and an apartment, that's $100,000 off of the price, which can make housing much more affordable if we could get rid of parking. And let me, I'm not going to get too sciencey here, but I've seen pre them involved in presentations. The other thing that's going to change us on parking are autonomous vehicles, ultimately. And it's going to happen faster than you think, because we're not going to need parking spaces. Future. But that's not now. You still have to deal with parking today. You're not going to sell that to anybody today, except they're beginning to implement in various places the autonomous vehicles. Florida is much more serious than we are in California about it right now. The mm -hmm. uh, presentation I saw back in Florida is pretty remarkable what they're doing. So we'll get there. But the car has to, right now we have to accommodate the car, but also this notion about the car. We learned in Pasadena as we were starting the plan, we did a, a analysis, and Ara worked with us on this, and Ara concluded that if you live in the central district of Pasadena, your trip generation, your BMT per capita is 36% less. So a third reduction in vehicle trips than if you live up by the Roosevelt, or live out east in the more suburban parts of Pasadena. So we get the density, we get the right mix of uses, and you, Eat for setting aside autonomous vehicles, you don't need so many vehicles. We're not there yet, no. <laughs> so about uh, Measure S that you mentioned, um, I'm actually having um, this debate with myself, considering uh, being a person who's a victim of traffic uh, on a daily basis. Uh, I work in downtown LA and I live in the west, west side, so I understand that it's a lot of um, basically spaces that can be reused in downtown LA, and it's definitely perfect for us as planners and architects to be involved with that, and we can make it, make it great. Um, but if the infrastructure is not designed in a way that would help us basically to get rid of the car, that parking reduction would be a massive problem in addition to traffic. So. Uh, it's like not that you can walk to the to, to work necessarily because you are not that close and the price and value of property is like super high and extreme in LA um, so it's it's just like a, I'm, I myself I'm somewhere in between that can't decide it's, it's, it's a little chicken and egg problem in spacing etc <clears throat> when Santa Monica developed their what's called the loose line your circulation element they did some detailed analyses and that plan allowed, I believe, something like six million square feet of additional non-residential development. And I've forgotten that, but it's 6,000, 8,000 housing units to run with the numbers. <coughs> a significant, significant increase. They were able to empirically demonstrate that all that development would not increase any trips and make it worse in Santa Monica, provided 
that A, all the use is fully developed, so that means 100% build out per that plan, and secondarily, uh, the uses that were proximate to the transit stations that are now open and the densities that were achieved there, and nobody within a half mile had a parking space and everybody in there, all businesses within that half mile had to provide transit passes to their employees. Some, some, in some considered some draconian, but hypothetically, if we mix and plan our land uses right, we can ultimately get to the end state of that. The dilemma is the period of time from here to there. So the big issue over here in Bergamot was the Bergamot plan actually met those objectives because actually was adding housing into area that has zero housing today. But the, we had 11,000 signatures from people primarily living north of Montana. And the 11,000 signatures was because the one first project in the area, the infamous Heinz project, that had that mix of 60-40 housing, commercial, and offices, that one project in and of itself was not going to get to that net zero increase in trips, only if the whole area had built out. So the dilemma is being prepared, if we are, if we have the willingness to get through that period of time where, frankly, it will get worse until we can reach that period of time in which it could get better at the end. And people generally, if that's a 20 year, 25 year period, are probably not so willing to sign a petition because of that very issue. So it's kind of a tough issue that's getting there. And then I will also comment, the other real issue is the housing affordability issue. You know, the, the reality is, even if that housing would be provided in the Bergamont area, would those units have been affordable to Universal, to Red Bull, and the other kinds of uh, uses in the area? So, you know, do we have to go back to the idea of company towns where the company actually provides the housing for the employees? I don't know. But because of the cost of land and cost of housing, you know, you know, just a real classic example that uh, worked years ago out in Santa Clarita, and Santa Clarita uh, years ago was just strictly a bedroom community for the North San Fernando Valley. Today, the magic term and solution was jobs housing balance. We're going to have enough jobs out here to match the number of people living out there. Well, they've got it. Except what happened is the hot cost of housing went up. The jobs were not paying the wages that then the people who live in those houses can afford to live there. So those people moved out to the uh, Antelope Valley. So it's this rubber band effect that we've got to get a control somehow, <clears throat> you know, and I don't know if it's just flooding thousands of housing units, but the, our, frankly, our dilemma of what we're building in downtown LA when the apartments start at $2,400 a month, that's not affordable to a lot of people who are working in downtown LA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have the magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I have a feeling that basically the, um, the culture in Europe and America has changed a lot. I feel like when it started, there was like individuality, I want freedom, I want to have my own way, I want to take the car and get to suburbia, I have my own, my own block, and I'm independent from anybody else, and I don't have to socialize. And I feel like with the increase in population and all the things that we're going through now, the, the culture has totally changed. The culture has changed. Yeah, well, that's, that's, the millennials, you know, this is a cliche to say this term, they want that interaction. We've done yeah. surveys, and, and we did surveys actually in uh, our office up north in, in Berkeley, did surveys of, uh, for the high tech Silicon Valley uh, users up there in terms of what the employees are looking for in terms of a type of living environment. They want that culture, they want that social interaction, they want to be in a place that is not suburban, they want to be in places very active where they can get to the arts, etc. And that's what's driving uh, in terms of locational decisions by Apple and Google and some of these other businesses as well. And this is happening mostly in cities and most of the suburbia are yeah. out, basically? We're, we're, we're always going to have, we're always going to have sub suburbs. They're not going to go away. But what we did, it, I worked for, uh, on a project I worked on when I was working on the new campus of UC Merced, uh, we were looking at sustainable development projects, etc. because the concept of Merced is not just the university campus, but it's campus and community. And we're not going to wall off the campus from the community. We're going to have an integrated town down relationship. The, the town hasn't yet developed. The university developed. <laughs> the town is still struggling to get developed. But the idea was permeable, permeability between town and gown. And we went down to this project in uh, University of Arizona and developer partnered on called Savannah. 
and at the time was the, if you will, the pinnacle of sustainable development practices as well. And it's surrounded by the typical, you know, stick built residential subdivisions, etc. So we asked the developer and the university why they had developed in this area other than for the purposes of being sustainable. And they said, we had a market analysis done. And what we found is when any developer is having a market analysis for a residential subdivision, they're going for comparables. What has been selling? What's the, you know, what's the market going to be that's out there? And what we found is that 60% of the market wants that, at that time, wanted that traditional suburban house, et cetera, on the lot, et cetera. But that leaves 40% who are not, we're not providing for that other 40%. And 40% is a huge number of people if we start providing for them as well. So this untapped market that we should be going for because they want something different. Doesn't mean it's all 100% acceptance, but even if you get 40%, and we're not providing for any of that 40% now, that's a huge number. A few questions. One, I mean, you were talking about the rethinking in our concepts and how the developers you know, should be encouraged to create, you know, the streetscapes and uh, public, you know, areas and green space and so on. And I was wondering, what do we think, you know, the incentives should be for developers? As we know, you know, developers, you know, look at numbers. It has you know, to pencil out for them, otherwise they won't do the development. And the cities, and all of us, we need these developers you know, to come in and invest their money and start you know, to create you know, what we think is a viable and a good uh, urban design. Now, do we, do we have to support the eminent domain if that's necessary? What do you think about the eminent domain? And how, how do we encourage you know, developers to participate in our way of thinking as designers. Okay. Uh, first, eminent domain, well, we don't have redevelopment agencies anymore, so eminent domain probably, other than for infrastructure like my high-speed rail project <coughs> I'm currently involved with. Uh, it, it, but the point being is we have plenty of areas we show on these slides you don't need eminent domain. You have these vacant lots on the commercial corridors. You have, right now, on its own, all these lots in downtown LA that are being converted you have this, what's happening now with Jefferson Los Angeles with that project actually. And that was not something that the city went in to get the property, but that was where I, the land values have become such that I heard the numbers in Pasadena recently are astounding. Uh, you know, they're, they're, the value is so high that developers want to go, you know, they're looking actively for parcels of properties to, to, to develop. So I don't think that's the issue. I think in terms of creating the amenity, the, the things that are the extras, uh, for Jefferson Los Angeles, we had an economics firm, Kaiser Marsh and Associates, run pro formats for developers. They basically actually asked if we're going to create these additional greenways as a part of that project. And if you're a residential project, you have to provide a certain amount of on-site green space. If you're a commercial developer, you don't. So we ran uh, basically pro formats for the commercial phase of the component uh, where you couldn't require, so you couldn't require the green space. And we had a pro forma analysis of how much additional development capacity would have to be created to make it economically worth the time of the developer as an incentive to provide for that number. We backed into the density for that site based upon that economic analysis. So we started with the base of FAR 1.0, but if you get up to 3.0, if you provide that green space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, you mentioned about the Port of you know, this, uh, which is a newer uh, development and definitely it's one of the most beautiful urban design, you know, um, urban fabrics that we've seen. How do you compare that to Philadelphia, which is an older, I don't know if you're familiar with Philadelphia, no, which is an amazing, an amazing urban fa fabric. I mean, old versus new, and how they achieved it at that time, many years ago, Mr. Penn, you know, came up with this idea, and now we're seeing it in um, Portland, right. Oregon, and how we can, you know, uh, do this, you know, over and over, more and more. Um, well, Portland and Pearl was a result of a collaboration between a development organization within the city and developers and private developers and partnership. There's a city-private partnership to put that together, and that's how that happened. Port of Philadelphia developed sort of, you know, with, with a, at a time, a really good plan. 
who had that vision. He created a, sort of like the Chicago plan. They, they had a plan for the area, uh, and probably <coughs> was a lot cheaper then, too, uh, et cetera, and less expensive. Uh, and construction was less expensive. So we're in a different era where it, right now we're so driven by the reality of our products, by economics, and you know, sort of those other kinds of how we provide the incentives and how can we make that work. And it has to be a partnership, et cetera, uh, to make it work. Thank you.